Hello, in session four, we're going to be making a bench hook. In the process of making it, learning a number of skills and practicing a number of skills, not least all the marking up and planing things that we need to know to make the spice rack. And you're gonna make all your mistakes on this product. The first thing that we do is to reassemble the blade assembly. And we do that by taking our cap iron, carefully sliding the screw of that cap iron through that keyhole slot sliding it to the back of the plane iron, rotating it, and then bringing the cap iron back up to about a millimeter, millimeter and a half away from the edge of our plane iron. And we can use our lever cap as a screwdriver just to nip up that screw. This part's called the frog, and it's got two components that you need to look at. First of all you've got this lever and on the end of that lever you've got a disc and the second thing I want you to have a look at is this rectangular peg. If you look at the side of the plane you'll notice that that rectangular peg is in fact the end of a cranked lever that has a fulcrum at that point there where the pin is and the end of that crank lever is, is a stirrup that sits either side of a groove that's been cut into this brass wheel. Now if you look carefully, when I turn this wheel clockwise, you'll notice that the end of the lever goes in that direction. And when I turn it anti-clockwise, the lever goes in this direction. You'll also notice when I'm turning anti-clockwise, that the wheel is actually traveling in that direction along the thread. And when I turn the wheel clockwise, it's turning, it's moving in that direction along the thread. And that is an indication that it's a left-handed thread. And that's all to do with the ergonomics of the plane. The expectation is that when you turn the wheel clockwise, the blade will stick out of the plane more. When you turn it anti-clockwise, it'll go backwards. When I put the plane assembly, the, the plane blade assembly into the plane, it's really important that I don't dink it against the side of the body and that I settle it onto that square peg. And also that wheel that we had a look at is sitting in this cutout on the plane blade. So when I move the lever left and right, the blade moves from left to right. And when I turn the wheel, anti-clockwise, you can see the blade assembly is sliding up the frog, which is that angle bit. When I turn it clockwise, it slides down the frog. I just check that the whole assembly is nice and straight within the body of the plane. I pop the lever cap over the top and just squash that lever down and the whole thing's set. I now have to decide how much of the blade is going to be sticking out and I can feel that with my thumb. In fact, your thumb's probably much more sensitive than your eyesight in working out how much that blade's sticking out. So I'm just going to turn that anti-clockwise. It's sticking out a little bit too far at the moment until when I run, rub my thumb against that sharp edge, and it's not going to cut me if I go in that direction. It'll cut me if I go in that direction. I can just feel that the blade is sticking out an equal amount each side. In fact, it's sticking out a little bit more this side than that side. So I'm just going to move that lever in that direction towards me and that will even that out. That feels pretty good. I'll leave it on its side. Think of kittens and putting them to sleep, not literally putting them to sleep, putting them to bed, I should say, <laughs> um, whenever you put a plane down. It's really, to me, it, it's a re it makes sense. You, you always put a plane on its side. Right, next stage, we're gonna actually use it on a piece of wood at last. You'll notice that I set up my timber on my workmate, supported by bits of MDF to raise the level of the timber above my holding pieces. Um, I'm lucky to have that MDF available to me. You could probably use, I don't know, kids early readers or something like that to pack underneath there, just so that you get the wood high enough not to clip these plastic bits with your plane. Um, the other thing that I would recommend you do is to have a look at the surface of your timber before you take that really sharp edge to it. 
If you are lucky and your palette hasn't been used to shift loads of, I don't know, cement or something very abrasive, you won't have a problem with the, with the quality of the surface. But if for any reason your timber is dirty, it's a good idea to use a wire brush or, uh, or something else to get the surface free of anything abrasive that is likely to mess up the sharp edge of your plane. I hope that mine has been used to lift something like big boxes of baby's nappies or something clean like that. Okay, let's have a go. So to hold the plane, what you do is to use an assassin's dagger grip on that knob at the end there. And then your grip on the other end of the plane, on this part, which is called a tote, is that your finger goes down the side of the plane and the tip of your finger is touching that pin, which is the fulcrum for that lever we were talking about earlier. And your grip is completed by your thumb resting on top of your three fingers. So three fingers, one finger, thumb, that's the grip. And you start your plane over the edge of the work. So you look through the throat of the plane, this little pillar box bit here, and you bring the plane back to a point where you no longer see the wood through the throat, you can just see the floor. You take a step forward with your left foot, brace your right leg, put a little bit of weight on here, and you push, <laughs> you push the plane forward. Now that is taking quite a heavy chunk off there, and I don't want that. Now it's at this point that you have to set how much blade you want sticking out to suit the particular job that you're doing. Now because this is a very uneven surface, I'm only taking the high bits off and not the low bits. I'm taking the tops of the mountains off if you like and my shavings are about that coarse. If I, if I have anything coarser than that, I'm first of all gonna have to put a lot of effort into the work and secondly as you can see it's happening my workmate is going to start dancing all over the floor so the it's an optimum cut that you're after I'm going to put my foot on the footrest of the workmate to stop it moving too much and first of all you concentrate on taking all the high bits off. And what you're doing, you're using the flat surface, which is the sole of your plane, to guide the blade over the wood so that you're reproducing the flatness of the plane sole onto your work. And you keep on going until you've got rid of all the valleys and you try and take as much wood off one side as the other so as you get down a bit you can take a shaving off the left a shaving off the right if you can manage it and a shaving off the middle And we can have a look at what I've achieved. And without too much effort, I've got myself a surface that will be good enough for our bench hook. Wouldn't be good for much else. And I've got quite a lot of staining on here as well. But that is the beauty of having a sharp plane. I've done a bit of work on the other side too. So I have an idea what this surface might look like when it's totally planed up and what this surface looks like when it's totally planed up. And I've discovered there's quite a big knot in here which I don't really want showing. So I'd like this 
to be the side that people see. And I call that the face side. So it's a plain surface that is the side of the wood that you're going to have visible on the end product. And now I've got a side which is going to be my face edge. Now that's not too difficult with this piece of wood because there's a knot on this edge which could prove difficult. I'd rather get rid of that because I'm going to make this slightly narrower maybe. Um, and this side looks pretty even and not free. So I'm going to make this my face side and I'm going to put a face side mark which is a loop. You start the loop close to the edge of the material, you bring it round back on itself and you, that last tail of the loop flies off the end. And then when we've completed planing this, we'll put an upside down V to join up with that loop. So let's just get the face edge on here. Right, we've now got a complete shaving from beginning to end. Plane's cutting nicely on its side. And I just want to check that that face edge is at 90 degrees to my face side. So I'll use my engineer's tri-square against my face side on my face edge and have a look along it. And I can see that it's lower on this side than on this side. So when I put my plane back onto the work, I got to tilt it slightly in that direction. So my plane, I can settle it on the surface that I've got already. I tilt it fractionally towards the camera. better days. That's perfect. I don't know whether you can see, but nice and square. So now I can put my face edge mark to join up with my face side mark, an upside down V there. Now, from now on, any measurements that I take, whether it be drawing a line at 90 degrees to that edge, or whether it be measuring the distance from here to the other side, I'm going to use that as my reference edge. So the face side, face edge marks have got two functions. They're a reference edge to measure from, and also they're a visual clue as to which is the best surface to be seen. Before we go any further, one of the features of both a face side and a face edge is that they should be dead flat. And ideally you need a straight edge to judge whether that is totally flat. Now I can tell you that it's slightly bowed in that direction. But because we're only using short lengths and because it's for a bench hook, I'm quite happy that that's a little bit bowed. I don't want to spend ages getting rid of the bow because the short, you know, for, for what that matters over such a short distance, uh, for what we're going to use it for, it doesn't matter. What does matter though, is that this is dead straight. And I've just checked that. And because I'm using a number five plane, it would be quite difficult for me to make this at all curved. So it is dead straight. And that means that every line I draw at 90 degrees to an edge is going to be 90 degrees. Now that I am interested in.